now we're ready for lesson number five. And this one is called The Birth of a Nation. In a sense, the birth of our nation uh, occurred in what we call Independence Hall, because it was in that very famous building that the Constitution, or first of all, the, the Declaration of Independence was written and signed. And that was a monumental affair when those men literally signed it in their blood. And had they lost it, of course, they would have all been hanged for treason. And then the Founding Fathers worked out the Constitution in that hall. So that's a very sacred place to us. I wondered uh, through whose eyes you would like to have seen those great historic events that brought forth the birth of our nation. Some think of Madison, some think of Washington or Franklin. But the eyes that first perceived the absolute necessity of the American colonies becoming free and independent, those eyes belong to a man named Samuel Adams. Samuel Adams. That's your first blank. Samuel Adams. <clears throat> Samuel Adams was a most interesting person, and very often he is misrepresented in our history books with um, cliches that don't really describe the man. If you will read the three volumes of his life by Wells, I think you'll gain an insight into the fact that here was one of the greatest of the founding fathers. Now, first of all, let's put down his birth date. It was 1722, and he was born, of course, up in Massachusetts there at Boston. He entered Harvard at the age of 14, and he graduated with a master's degree from Harvard at the age of 21. Thought you'd be interested in that, you scholars. All right, he could have been wealthy, but he deliberately turned down that opportunity in order to stay involved in public affairs. Uh, he felt that good politics is a divine science designed for the happiness of the people. And he was committed to that, dedicated to it. And he passed that on to a lot of young disciples who gathered around him in Massachusetts. All right. From his earliest youth, he believed that there was a divine destiny for the American people to become a powerful, free, and independent nation. So capital D is destiny. Now, he gathered these outstanding young people around him there in Boston, who later became presidents of the United States in some cases, governors and others, but were all prominent founders and leaders at the beginning of our nation's history. One was his cousin, John Adams. Now, Samuel was 13 years older than John, who became, as you know, our second president of the United States. And John Adams was brilliant. He had some little personality quirks. They didn't make him particularly popular, but John Adams used to say, I know that good politics is a divine science for the government and happiness of the people, and I'm going to stand for it no matter how unpopular it makes me. Then there was John Hancock, who became governor of Massachusetts. He also was tutored and trained by Samuel Adams. And then Josiah Quincy, that we see... Um, um, here, uh, Josiah Quincy was sent to England to try and get the Whigs to support us. And uh, interestingly enough, he died on the way home just as he came back inside of land. He died. Then there was Joseph Warren, bless his heart. There was a great patriot. And he was killed at Bunker's Hill. That's a very famous painting where he was, he was among the 500 who were shot and bayoneted to death. Well, of course, another companion of Samuel Adams was our famous Paul Revere the Knight Rider of the Revolution, and the official messenger for the Committee on Correspondence. When everything would happen in, in Boston, it would be he who would take the message down. And all of you remember his famous Knight Ride, of course. He was, he was a great man, by profession a silversmith. But he was a prominent public servant. All right, Samuel Adams was up front in almost every important event that occurred. Um, that's why they call him the father of the revolution. He was right, or excuse me, of independence. He's called the father of independence because he was out in front in nearly all of those early events in our history. <clears throat> At the age of 21, he wrote his master's degree in which he was able to justify the use of armed force against the king if he behaved in a lawless manner against their constitutional rights. 
See, just 21 he wrote that. Number one is armed. Number two, when the king tried to put a tax on the people in 1765, <clears throat> it was Sam Adams who was the first one to make a formal declaration that it was unconstitutional to have taxation without representation. Everybody picked it up a little later. But as far as we know, he is the first. So number two is representation. Now, he was the one that initiated the Committees on Correspondence that probably did more than anything to unite the colonies. See, that was his contribution. It's, it's interesting to watch this fellow. Things that we've taken from granted or for granted, in many cases, originated with him. Then when the Stamp Act was passed, he said, now let's unite on this thing. Let's have a Congress, you see. Let's have a Congress. Here's one of the stamps up here on the screen. And let's protest unitedly. And they did, and they got it repealed. And then uh, the king <clears throat> persisted in some other unconstitutional activities and rather abrasive tactics. And so Samuel Adams was the one that initiated the idea of non-importation and non-consumption against British merchandise. Now, I'll tell you, this did a lot of good because it got the British merchants on the side of the colonies. They said to the king, now, you just got to stop this. Americans aren't buying British. They've stopped. Well, that was Sam Adams, and Jefferson carried it on in Virginia, and they got that thing going. Well, after the Boston Massacre, it was Sam Adams that succeeded in, get, in, in just insisting that the governor get those troops out of Boston and on an island in the harbor. So your blank is troops. Now, I've already told you about um, the fact that when the tea was sent over, it was Sam Adams that pleaded with the governor to get that ship out of there because they were not going to be legally tricked into buying it. And the governor could have uh, expropriated it after 20 days if it were not unloaded and then sold it at auction with the tax attached and used it, used it as a precedent. And uh, Sam kept warning him, and when the king paid no attention, he got the people all together at the South Church. They made their final plea, and then they went out and just took the tea, and the people stood solemnly by. You know, I used to think that it was a tremendous, uh, kind of a hoopla party, but it wasn't. It was a very solemn thing. They knew they were throwing down the gauntlet. They knew it might lead to war. They knew they might have to pay for the tea and damages, but they weren't going to be tricked. All right, um, now, when the uh, four intolerable acts were imposed on Boston, uh, and they were intolerable to the people, it was Sam Adams that suggested that we have a Congress now, a, a regular Continental Congress, uh, which was held in 1774. And Sam Adams was the first one there to um, encourage that program, that they, they get together from here on out and unite their efforts in protest against these things that were happening. He says, we're, we're definitely going on a disaster course. And uh, he said in the very first Continental Congress, I think if we were wise, we would go right ahead and go for independence. Oh, my goodness, at that time. That was two years ahead of everybody else. They weren't ready for that. And some people called him a firebrand, but he wasn't. He was a very thoughtful, meditative type of political philosopher. He saw what was happening. All right. Then it was Sam Adams who had the, was the first one to have a price on his head, 500 pounds. And in those days, that was a tremendous amount of money, I tell you. All right, there was a period of about 12 months when Americans moved from being loyal Englishmen to loyal United Americans. It was a shift because in the beginning, they, they wanted to be loyal to King George. They had an affection for the king. They felt it was his, his ministers who had made all the mistakes. Sam didn't believe so, but most of the rest did. But they turned from being loyal Englishmen to loyal Americans in about a 12-month period. During the first 15 years or so of the oppression by the parliament and the king, they responded merely with protests and petitions. That's capital A, petitions. But I'll tell you, the killing or wounding of around 95 Americans at Lexington and Concord on April the 19th began changing the feelings. See, there was at Lexington where the Minutemen, having been warned by Paul Revere, tried to cross, get across in front 
of that advancing, those advancing troops, and, and several of them are killed there and wounded, about 18 as I recall there. And then of course, uh, later on there were some exchanges at Concord and all the way back to Boston, about 95 were killed or wounded uh, at that time. Then there was a killing or wounding of about 500 at Bunkers Hill, actually on, most of it on Breed's Hill. All right, now I tell you that got people excited. Now you see here, let me just show you this, this while we have it. See that's Charleston. Up here you have Boston, that's across the Charles River, and they bombarded Charleston, got it burning, and then you see we come down here to a little hill out in the cow pasture, and that's Breed's Hill. And then Bunker's Hill's a little further over here. All right, um, now some of the conservative members of the Congress, particularly John Dickinson, he was a good patriot, but he didn't want to be independent. He loved America, but he also loved England. And so he got the folks together and they sent a, an olive leaf of peace to the king. They wanted everything to be nice and straightened out. And guess what? The king said he wouldn't read the petition of traitors and rebels. And I'll tell you that ruffled John's feathers just a little to be called a traitor when he was trying to be loyal to the king and, and uh, kind of get things solved. All right, now, all that the king would do is just send over more British troops. And he said he would subdue them uh, with the utmost endeavors. In fact, on August the 23rd, 1775, he announced that he considered the colonies in general rebellion. And therefore, he said, I'll send all the troops I have to and all the ships I have to in order to put them down. Well, that was bad because they had the biggest army and the biggest navy in the world. All right, on December the 22nd, 1775, the king issued an even harsher proclamation which virtually abrogated the colonists as British subjects. The king said the Americans were to be treated as enemies and any of their ships could be seized and their crews could be impressed into the, the British Navy and anybody who took the ship could have it for his own as well as everything that was in the ship. Now you can see how blood was beginning to boil by, by this time. All right, next, next one, capital G. About this time, Tom Paymer arrived. Actually, he'd been over there about two years. But he came out in the open for the first time with his little book, Common Sense. Common Sense is your blank there. And Tom Paine said, you just don't understand King George. He's very stubborn. And he is violating your constitutional rights. You have no possibility of reconciling him. And so you will be smart if you just save your time and go ahead and declare your independence and then do what you have to do to support it. His little book, Common Sense, sold 120,000 in just a matter of weeks. It was a really a bestseller. All right, 120,000. <clears> and he suggested that they go completely for independence, which is capital H. All right, Roman numeral three. The Americans began transferring their allegiance from England to the United Colonies as follows. On May the 4th, 1776, Rhode Island went right ahead and declared her independence without waiting for anybody. We're independent. That's Rhode Island. That's the most interesting little colony of all the 13. Uh, and here they were uh, having a big conference, deciding what they should do. And, uh, and little Rhode Island says, why fool around? We're independent. <laughs> they declared their independence. They didn't want to wait for the other colonies. All right. Now, since King George had outlawed the elected assemblies of the various colonies, John Adams introduced a resolution in Congress on May the 10th, 1776, to authorize each colony to set up its own government independent of the crown. Independent of the crown. And for all intents and purposes, this was the beginning of a complete colonial separation from England. That act that was done on May the 10th, 1776. Now, on May the 15th, 1776, the Virginia legislature instructed its delegates in Congress to take the initiative in having, uh, let's see, in having the American colonies officially declared to be free and independent states. In other words, let's not wait, along, wait around anymore. And so uh, one of the leaders of the delegation from Virginia, Richard Henry Lee, introduced his very famous uh, proposal 
that these united colonies are and of right ought to be free and independent. They were to be colonies of England no more. And it was a very risky thing to do. This would be counted by the king as treason. And all of you remember what the penalty for treason was. It was very severe. Be hanged by the head until dead. Excuse me, until unconscious. Then disemboweled while still alive. Then cut into four quarters and, and then distribute the, well, boil it in oil and then distribute the remnants over the field so that the last resting place of that person would be unknown, unmarked, and unhonored. That was the price of, of treason. All right, the more conservative delegations were so frightened by this bold, energetic demand for independence that they pleaded for a time to get instructions from their states, meaning their legislatures at home. And so they decided to postpone action on this proposition until July the 2nd. Uh, meanwhile, uh, many of them were so confident it would go through, they appointed a committee of five to write the Declaration of Independence. And all of you remember that uh, that committee included Thomas Jefferson, Franklin, and Adams, uh, as well as Roger Sherman and Robert Livingston. They all agreed, even though Franklin and Madison, excuse me, did I say Madison? Adams, John Adams, all agreed that Franklin and Adams were two of the best writers in the Congress. They appointed this young fellow, big, tall, red-headed fellow from Virginia, Thomas Jefferson, to do the writing. Now, he had done some writing already and had gained a reputation for it. On July the 2nd, the Continental Congress voted to adopt the Virginia Resolution, which declared that the American colonies were free and independent. I tell you, that was an exciting moment. But no public announcement was made because they wanted to do it in this formal declaration that Jefferson was writing. So on July the 4th, 1776, the majority of the delegates representing 12 states Georgia did not send representatives. They signed, uh, they voted to accept the Declaration of Independence drafted by Jefferson. And now all of you know that um, um, John Hancock was the one who signed with the, the big letters. You remember that? And nobody else signed at that time, just he. The rest signed later when it had been engrossed and uh, put in a, a very formal form. They all signed. John Hancock signed again. That was August the 2nd, August the 4th, I'm sorry, August the 4th, that they really all signed it formally. And two or three that weren't there on August the 4th signed it later. All right, now the American Declaration of Independence was a preliminary constitutional document. It really is one of our most important charters of liberty. And uh, the signing of it was why the ringing of the Liberty Bell was such a significant thing because it didn't used to be cracked in those days and it rang with a great vigor and, and a clamor to express the joy of the people. Now in the Declaration of Independence they set forth their basic beliefs. Basic beliefs. Now you won't find those in the Constitution. The philosophical document is the Declaration of Independence. The Constitution is built on those beliefs. And so all that you'll find in the Constitution is the structure of a government. The beliefs are in the Declaration of Independence. And they started out by explaining why they felt a formal written declaration was necessary. Now let me just share with you an opinion of my own. I think that the reason the founders went to all of this trouble was so that other people who were being abused and imposed upon would have a format of philosophical justification for breaking free because they continually talk about the day when they hope all mankind will be free. See, that was kind of a mission that they had. So I think if you really knew the in, inner hearts of these men, you'd find that the reason they wrote it out so carefully was so that there, the others would have something to go by. So here was their explanation. Let's read it together. Uh, that is why they needed a formal written declaration. Written declaration. When, in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth 
the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and of nature's God entitles them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires that they should declare the causes which impel them to the separation. And so they say, we're now going to give you that explanation. And here it goes. They said um, that, first of all, uh, we hold that all men are created equal. Now, they call this a self-evident truth, that all the masses of humanity are created equal. And they thought that that was a self-evident fact. Now, be, be, before we say that, would you also have to say that it would be self-evident that there was a creator to create his equal? You see, they didn't think they had to establish that because that was almost universally accepted at that time. So the creator created us equal. And yet, as I look out across this audience, I see uh, people that have a lot of things that uh, I don't have. Hair, for example. <laughs> Some of you play the piano, and I don't do that. And um, that's, we're just different, aren't we? Our talents are different. Well, how are we equal? In what way are we equal? Now, first of your blank is the acceptance that there's a creator. That's your first blank. And then the fact that we are created equal before God. That's your first one. We're equal before God. Now, that means that if you do something good or I do something good, it won't matter whether we're rich or poor. We'll get the same recognition and appreciation by our Creator. If we do something bad, it won't matter how rich we are, who our ancestors were, the color of our skin, our religion, or anything else. In the eyes of God, we're equal. Right? The one difference is that God does take into consideration whether we knew what we were doing. He's a just God. And so everything is tempered with him in terms of what we did and under what circumstances. But anyone else doing the same thing under the same circumstances would be treated the same. Everybody follow that? All right, and then we're equal before the law. You see, the law should administer justice the same way God would do. And we're equal in our rights. It doesn't matter who we are, poor or rich, American or non-American, our rights should be the same. As far as God is concerned, they're inalienable. And then, of course, we ought to recognize there is no inalienable right <clears throat> uh, to be equal in talents, property, skills, good looks, or rich relatives. <laughs> Those are things that make life interesting and different, right? Right? So those are all the vari varieties of life. But wherever we are, whatever we're doing, we're equal before God and the law and our rights. Now that's where our equality comes, comes from. And uh, there is no inalienable right to be equally popular or to be um, socially acceptable. Those are things we each earn and each people has to, to earn. And now that brings me to the problem of minorities that have the feeling that um, they aren't being treated equal. And very often, minorities, by the very nature of human relations, have a real tough time. But let me tell you something. Everybody in this room is a descendant of a minority. Isn't that interesting? First, you see, the Indians were here. And when the French came, the Indians gave them fits. All right, that's your French there. And when the English came over, the French gave them fits. How do you like that? <laughs> That's the way it's been with all of us. And I give you a list here of minorities, just some of the minorities that all of you uh, in the aggregate will be descendants of. Swedes, the Dutch, the Germans, the Irish, Scandinavians. That's my people. My goodness, when they came over, nobody was welcoming them in Boston and New York. The Irish had taken it over ahead of time. <laughs> Um, they'd had, the Irish had their tough time, I'll tell you, but by the time my people got over, they had to go west to Minnesota and to North Dakota and uh, South Dakota and the Jensens and the Janssens and the Skousens and all of us got over there, right? We're all part of minorities and we all had to be treated accordingly. Well, I've traveled in 44 foreign countries and it is my estimation that minorities have no opportunity anywhere in the world of getting their break faster than in the United States. But they have to work hard, and I guess there's no better example of great Americans who started out 
with a very severe handicap than um, the Japanese and Chinese. See, just a hundred years ago, you could shoot a Chinaman and it wasn't even considered murder. That is in California. But they were smart. They didn't go home. They worked hard. They ran their laundries. They worked on the Central Pacific Railroad. They sent their children to school. And as late as World War II, we had all the Japanese put in concentration camps. J. Edgar Hoover warned the president it wasn't necessary. He said those who were re involved were very few in number, and we picked them up. The rest of the people don't have to be put away, but the president and the governor of California, Governor Warren, insisted they put, be put in concentration camps in the mountains. Those people could have been so bitter, but they weren't. They encouraged their sons to enlist in the army, and they did. And they were one of the most valiant contingents of the military, particularly in the landings in Italy. Isn't that interesting? They came home one of the most decorated groups that we had in military service in World War II. Well, I'll tell you, they are first-class citizens of the day, and one of the senators that represents the whole great state of California is... Japanese. Isn't that interesting? All right. Now, Eldridge Cleaver, he was uh, a black American, and he thought that certainly there was no chance for a black American to have a chance. In fact, he thought that America hated blacks. And so he and his associates, he says in his book called On Ice, went out to wreck America. And they would bomb, burn, shoot, rape, do everything they could to destroy society. And of course, he eventually had to leave but after he'd traveled all over Europe and Asia, here's what he said. He came home and he said, I'd rather be in jail in America than free in those socialist and communist countries. So I was wrong, and the Black Panthers were wrong. We American blacks are inside the system, and I feel that the number one objective for black Americans is to, be rec is to recognize that they have the same equal rights under the Constitution as Ford or Rockefeller. And you see, actually, that is the... That's what we call becoming an, a full, uh, what should we say, full-scale American. Um, once you can take yourself for granted and realize that you're part of the system, which my father was able to do, a second-generation Scandinavian. He just said, we're, we're as good as anybody else. We work hard. We'll make our way. And uh, he didn't feel um, like a second-class citizen. And he told his children they were first-class citizens, and they felt like they're part of the system. Eldridge Cleaver says, I do too now, and uh, America's the place to be. Boy, they didn't treat me very well over there in those communist and socialist countries. I thought that's where minorities would be appreciated. No, it's in America that we have our very best chance. Well, that brings us to the conclusion of the first half of lesson number five, and we'll, con we'll continue now a little later. <laughs>